what is the achievement gap? The achievement gap is, the, is this, and we, and we now have so much evidence, it would fill this room if you took all the printed reports uh, and, and data tables about this, uh, is this persistent pattern. Kids who grow up in poor families on average do not perform as well academically as kids who grow up in middle class and affluent homes. And uh, we've known that for a long time and we have, and we, can, and we can lay out the dimensions of that gap very precisely because we administer all sorts of standardized tests to millions of kids every year. We collect a lot of information. We know what, what their family income is. We know what color they are. We know what ethnicity they are. We know whether they're eligible for free lunch or whether they're Engli English learners. We know a lot about them. And so we have a lot of information. Um, so why is it that poor kids, how come poor kids are not as well educated as middle class kids? We know the answer to that too, but we don't want to talk about it. And we don't want to talk about it in terms of formulating policies and actions and practices that would respond to it. Because we're still pretty timid about talking about issues around race and poverty in the United States. Um, so let me give you a view that is not controversial in terms of the strength of evidence for it, but which is controversial for its implications once you start to talk about, okay, now that we know this, what are we going to do about it? The, uh, here's a truism. If you want to be educated, you got to be able to read. Anybody disagree with that? Impossible to disagree with that. Uh, if you want to be educated well enough to attend a four-year university and graduate from that university, you need to be able to read pretty well because you have to be able to educate yourself. You have to be able to expand what you are given in school outside of school, you gotta be able to read on weekends and you gotta be able to explore topics that are of particular interest to you and et cetera. So you've got to be a strong reader in order to be well educated. Here's the second part of that. In order to be a strong reader, you gotta to learn to read when you're young. Now this may be a little less uh, unanimous in the, in, in the view, but the evidence is overwhelming. And here's the unfortunate truth. If you're not reading by, at grade level by the end of fourth grade, you have less than a one in 10 chance of ever reading at grade level. Less than one in 10 chance of ever reading at grade level, you're only 10 years old. So this is something that happens early. And if it doesn't, the school systems and Sylvan and Kaplan and Tutor, all the, in dealing with large numbers of kids who are reading below grade level after fourth grade, nobody has been successful with large numbers of kids consistently over time. So we better get this right early if we want to have a chance to close the achievement gap. Now, <clears throat> why is it, why is it that poor kids are so overrepresented in the third and fourth grade results that show us that there are a lot of kids in the United States who do not read well by third and fourth grade. And again, we have an awful lot of evidence about this. And here's where we really don't want to have too much of a public conversation. Reading is something that is, if you think about it, you're trying to take words that you know, that you've heard and that you've spoken and you're trying to decode them when they're given to you on the printed page. That's what reading is. So, it is, uh, and, we, and we do know this, being able to do that relies on your knowing a lot of words, having heard a lot of words, having spoken a lot of words. That's what helps young kids uh, learn to read. They can look at a picture of a cat something that all kids would know about, and they can see a very short word that is easy to remember, and they can begin to associate C-A-T with that picture of a cat 
that they may see on their way home or when they get home. That's sort of how you do it. And here's something else that we've known for a long time. If you want to learn to read the words that you don't know, you've got to know 90% of the words that are a part of that passage, wherever it is. If, if, if you're asked to read, uh, you know, something on, uh, on plasma physics, a technical document on plasma physics, if you're like me, and you would pick that page up and you'd say, gee, I don't know, I don't know what half these words mean, I would have zero chance of learning what those words meant by reading that text alone. But if I pick up something that is uh, an area of, of familiarity to me, and I know most of the words, 90% of the words, I can figure it out contextually. That's how you learn to read. Now, here's what we know. Kids growing up in poor homes, and these are all averages, by the way. It's very important to start with that because, because there's so many exceptions to what I'm telling you. But kids who grow up in poor homes hear less language. They hear many fewer words than kids growing up in middle class and affluent homes. There was a study done in Kansas City. It's frequently cited. It may not be scientifically reliable, but it's so intuitively uh, appealing and sensible that we keep citing it. And two political scientists there uh, sent trained observers into the homes of welfare families, into the homes of working class families, into the homes of professional families with tape recorders. And, they, and every month they would uh, be there for an hour or two. And all they would do is to observe and to record what was spoken between all the language that the kids in those homes heard beginning at age zero. They get, they get back from the hospital, and here's this guy with a re recorder waiting for them. And then they transcribed all of, these, all of these results, and they counted. They counted the words. And based on what they found about the words heard by a poor kid versus an affluent kid, by the age three, the affluent kid uh, would have heard 30 million more words than the kid in a welfare family. 30 million more words. Then they did a qualitative assessment of it. And they found out that most of the words that they heard in the affluent home were words in complete sentences. They were words where the adjectives uh, were, were used to modify the nouns, where, where there was, and where the child was spoken to in a way that, that was positive and encouraging. So for every cautionary reprimand that a kid in an affluent home heard, he or she heard six or seven positive reinforcements, encouragements. In the welfare home, for every word, every encouraging sentence every, that they heard, they heard two negatives. Don't do that. You can't do that. Stop. 